Welcome to the Illinois Family Institute Worldview Conference as we learn how to counter the religion of wokeism by becoming better disciples of Jesus Christ. I'm Monty Larrick. I serve with the Illinois Family Institute. I'd like to thank Pastor David Jones and the leadership of the Village Church of Barrington for their hospitality and for their courage for allowing us to be here. Also, a big thank you to Jim Crowder and his team for providing sound and visuals. Well, our conference is divided into four sessions with time for your questions. Well, about our first speaker, Dr. Everett Piper is a columnist for the Washington Times. He retired as president of Oklahoma Wesleyan University in May of 2019. He's the author of Not a Daycare, The Devastating Consequences of Abandoning Truth. Most recently, Grow Up, Life Isn't Safe, but it's good. <laughs> In an article in the Times about Packers quarterback, Aaron Rodgers, he recently wrote, ours is now a culture of smug snowflakes who think their new ways are always better than the old. Our courts, our Congress, our corporations, and yes, our sports are awash with a bunch of perpetual children who would rather have fun than acknowledge the facts. There's your trigger warning. <laughs> yeah, I used this line last night, and now he'll tell us what he really thinks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Everett Piper. Thanks a bunch for setting me up with all these Packer fans in here. <laughs> no, no it's, oh, okay, so there are no Packer fans? Let's just be clear here. Okay. Is that an applause or is that a groan of disapproval? Um, well, I'm pulling up my notes here. I do think it's important that you have context for who, who you're uh, engaging with today. They always say, know your audience. Well, it's good to know your speaker, too. So if you'll permit me, uh, maybe just five minutes, I'll set the context for who is this guy. A lot of you are probably wondering. I thought we were getting George Barna today. Who is this guy? I'm sorry to disappoint. I know I'm the second choice. But if you remember back, some of you may, many of you won't, to 2015, there was a story that went hot in the news. It went viral. It was a story about a college president from Oklahoma who was frustrated with the Snowflake Rebellion. It was a story of a guy who actually had the audacity to write an open letter to his students saying, if you want me to coddle you rather than to confront you, if you, we, if you want me to make you feel comfortable rather than tell you you need to be a man of character, then you need to go someplace else. Because at this institution, at this university, at this Christian college, Oklahoma Wesleyan University, when we require you to go to chapel and you listen to a sermon, we expect you to feel guilty. That's the point. <laughs> That's why you go to church. A good sermon is supposed to make you feel guilty. We want you to confess your sins. We don't want you to feel good about them. And then at the end of that open letter, with my frustration being evident with regard to the snowflakes who were saying periodically, you hurt my feelings. You made me feel uncomfortable. You triggered me. How dare you? I concluded my open letter by saying, my land, this is a university. It's not a daycare. Now, at the end of that open letter, and I told the story last night in a smaller venue, a smaller event, at the end of that letter after I said, this is a university, this isn't a daycare, I assumed the story was over. I had confronted my students. I had let the local community listen in because I wrote this as an opinion piece for the local small town newspaper. And I joked last night, generally when I wrote for the small town newspaper in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, five people read it and three people cared. <laughs> and my wife wasn't one of either one of those groups. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But somebody got a hold of that letter, and they sent it to Glenn Beck. And within 
two and a half weeks, three and a half million people had clicked on that story. And if you remember this at all, you may start, yeah, I, I kind of remember this. It was 2015, three and a half million read it, and Drudge and Dreher and Limbaugh and Beck and O'Reilly and Tucker Carlson and Fox and Friends and Brett Baer, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, even newspapers in Oxford, England, were picking up the story of the college president in Oklahoma that called out his students and told them to grow up. He actually had the audacity to tell them, life isn't supposed to be safe. That's not what education is for. The great lion Aslan wasn't safe, we're told in the Chronicles of Narnia, but he was good. And if I may paraphrase that for today, the great lion of the academy isn't safe, it should be good. The great lion of the ivory tower isn't safe, but it should be good. The great lion of the church isn't supposed to be safe, it should be good. The great lion of our constitution isn't safe, but it's good. Life isn't safe. We've elevated safety above all else in our culture today. COVID has exposed this cancerous tumor in our culture that we will sell our souls, we will sell our families, we will gladly give up our freedom for the sake of safety? When did that happen? Freedom is good, but it's not safe. So in the context of that today, I want you to know who you're talking to. Some people have suggested that my spiritual gift is uh, encouragement. I don't think so. <laughs> I think my spiritual gift is agitation. I'm not sure if that's in the scriptures or not. I was once told by a friend of mine who, who knows Ann Coulter quite well. You know Ann Coulter, uh, the blonde, long-haired blonde, conservative, quite outspoken. Um, my friend who knows her quite well pulled her aside once and said, and this is a direct quote, I think it's a true story. He said that he told Ann, Ann, you know the body of Christ has many members and you are the elbow. <laughs> That'll preach, won't it? Wokeism, I was asked to speak on the issue of wokeism. So what I'm gonna do with you right now, rather than ad lib and do a riff like I'm prone to do in some of my speaking, I'm gonna to try to discipline myself for the sake of Q&A thereafter because they want me to shut up at about 10.45 so that you can ask some questions, and I welcome that. I really do like the Q&A. So I'm gonna to try to control myself and stick to a script so that you have time to engage. I'm gonna share with you a specific scenario that, that it involved me and a pastor, okay? And this is what happened. The pastor actually messaged me. This was a few weeks ago. He messaged me. He sent me a note on Facebook. And after spending a great deal of time highlighting my limited knowledge of social psychology as well as my ignorance of cognitive and moral development theories, this pastor proceeded to chastise me for what he termed my confirmation bias. So he's telling me I was stupid, I'm not educated, I'm not intelligent enough, enough to know what social, social psychology actually is, even though I do have a couple degrees in that, as well as my ignorance of moral development theories, and I have a PhD in that too, but this guy apparently <coughs> felt that it was important to educate me, and he chastised me for my confirmation bias. So how was I guilty of this ideological foreclosure, you ask? Well, it seems that my sin was my criticism, my persistent criticism of what I call the ineffectual and bankrupt thinking of progressives. I think this man was offended by that. I think the elbow hit the ribs. <laughs> this is his quote, Jesus was neither a Republican or a Democrat, he said. And my critical coach proceeded to say, you focus on partisan politics all the time and it only distracts from the message of Christ. Surely if you were more open-minded, you could find some examples where Democrats are right and Republicans are wrong, close quote. Now, context is always king. I started out sharing context of who I am with you so you understand, and I think it's important that I understand my audience. Context is always king. I know that, you should know that, and so should my pastor friend, my critical coach. So I decided to ask a couple questions or two before 
succumbing to the temptation to answer him. So here's my question. Aside from the fact that Jesus obviously wasn't either a Republican or a Democrat, because last I knew, neither party existed at the time, can you tell me what exact policies, political policies and ideas, are of concern to you? Be specific. I'm not going to talk about this until you clarify yourself. What is it that you're offended by? Where do you think I'm wrong and you're right? I didn't get a response. So I decided, it's my Facebook page. I think I'll take advantage of it. So I said, please show me some specific case, cases where, as you say, Democrats are right and Republicans are wrong. Just show me. For example, please provide some evidence as to why politically correct justice is right and biblically correct justice is wrong. Can you tell me why denying the biological fact of a female is right while defending the empirical reality of a woman is wrong? Why is killing your youngest children right while fighting to protect them from a political party hell-bent on their execution wrong? Please tell me where it is ever right to hide the physical consequences of unbiblical sex while it's wrong to educate people of its harmful effects. Pastor, would you please explain to me why it's right for the state to presume to define marriage a sacrament of the church while fighting to keep the government out of the church's business is wrong. Please, please, please help me understand where the confiscation of private property, i.e. stealing it through taxation, debt, and inflation is right while defending the right of all citizens to work hard and enjoy the fruits of their labor is wrong. Can you provide any evidence that ignoring our nation's sovereignty is right while defending our country's borders, i.e., as God told Israel to defend its own, is wrong? Please share your evidence providing and proving that indoctrination of our children in schools committed to moral nihilism is right while training up our children in the way they should go is wrong. Please tell me why you think denying God's existence and expunging any mention of him from our courts, our Congress, and our classrooms is right while honoring him as the author and giver of all our unalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness is wrong. Please show me where dividing our country by race and color is right while working to unite it by virtue and character is wrong. Please provide evidence showing that the constant emphasis on my identity, on my victimization, is right while the focus on my responsibility and my obligations is wrong. Please tell me where God ever, ever blesses and protects a people who deny his existence, boo him at their national conventions, mock his minimal standards of morality, celebrate the killing of his youngest children, debauch five and 10 year olds on the altar of sexual politics and define themselves by their behaviors rather than the imago Dei they're being. Please tell me anywhere where this is right. Please tell me where any of this lunacy is right and why challenging it as suicidal is wrong. Now, I didn't get an answer. In fact, his silence was deafening. It was dumbfounding. It was actually as ridiculous as his initial question. It was as telling anyway. Here's my conclusion in this opening comment. There's a reason for the religious bigotry we see rife in our culture right now. There is a reason for the Christophobia pervasive in our Congress and our courts. There's a reason for the inflation, excuse me, there's a reason for the infatuation millennials have for big government. There's a reason our progeny smirks at American exceptionalism while they fawn over socialist regimes mired in the blood of millions. 
There's a reason media talking heads don't even understand the basics of what it means to be a male and female, biology, physiology, genetics, and DNA. There's a reason so many of our schools don't seem to understand the importance of the Imago Dei and instead treat their students as if they are little more than the Imago dog, animals defined by their desires. Their identity is nothing more than the sum total of their inclinations. You suggest that we're defined by our Lord and not our libido and they smirk and laugh at you. They're teaching our progeny to claim that their guttural instincts, their belly, their sexual drive is the end all and be all of who they are as human beings. That's the Imago dog people, that's not the Imago day. That's an insult to the human being. It's an insult to the male, it's an insult to the female. I'm off script right now, but how dare we dumb down the definition of a, of a female to nothing but a fabrication and a fantasy of a dysphoric male? This is crazy. You're the feminist because you believe in the female. You think a woman is a fact. She's not a fabrication. She's real. She's not a leprechaun. She's not a unicorn. She actually exists. And you're being criticized. This pastor is challenging me on the obvious logic and scientific fact of what I just said. You cannot be a feminist and disagree with me. It's impossible. If a female is a fantasy, you can't be a feminist. I cannot comply with Title IX as a college president if you're telling me to deny women the right to their own bathrooms, their own showers, their own sports, and their own scholarships, and to give it to some dude who's playing dress up and make believe. How dare, how dare a leader of the church suggest Otherwise, he's black-facing women. He's, he's, uh, he is somehow celebrating men who want to dress up in exaggerated costume and overblown makeup and pretend to be something they're not. That's exactly what whites did to blacks when we black-faced them. It was wrong then to do it to African Americans and it's wrong now to do it to women. You are the feminists. Stand up and say so and say enough's enough. You will not degrade my wife, my daughter, my mother. <laughs> and you women, don't remain silent. There's nothing more intimidating than an angry mom. <laughs> Take advantage of your status. There's a, reason, re, there's a reason that Glenn Youngkin is the governor of Virginia right now. And it's because women decided to lead while men sat on their hands. This is winnable. This is winnable because the truth will set you free. You are pro-science. You are pro-woman. You are pro-freedom. You are pro-liberty. As I said last night, you're the liberals. You're the ones who believe in liberty. You're the ones who are fighting for freedom. A classic liberal is somebody who believes in liberty. The progressives aren't liberals. Look at Canada. That's the proof. The progressive declares it a police state for emergency powers purposes and takes everybody's liberty away. Conservatives are ironically today more classically liberal than our left of center counterparts. You can win this one. They've stolen your words, they've stolen your identity, they've stolen your dignity, they claim their science when they deny, they, they're pro-science when they deny science. Woe well unto them who call evil good and good evil. Bitter sweet and sweet bitter. <laughs> male, female, and female, male. Freedom, slavery, and slavery, freedom. Woe well unto him who reverses the definitions of things that are obvious, clear, and factual. There's a reason. There's a reason for all of this, and the reason the reason that self-righteous pastors and politicians protect themselves behind the walls of their offices while telling all of the rest of us that a wall to protect our country is wrong. Let me read that again. There's a reason 
Self-righteous pastors and politicians protect themselves behind the walls of their offices while telling all of the rest of us that a wall to protect our country is wrong. Again, it's duplicitous, it's hypocritical. Walls are not bad. <laughs> Everybody lives in a house that has walls. This church has walls. And this nonsense about the separation of church and state. Yes, Thomas Jefferson said it to the Danbury Baptists in Connecticut. Why did he say it? Because they were worried about the government intruding into their business. And he said, don't worry about it. our constitution protects you. There's a wall separating the government from you. It can't do what you're worried about. Yes, there's a wall separating the church from the state, but it's there to protect the church from the state, not the state from the church. <laughs> this isn't rocket science. And guess what? Almost all walls have doors in them. They do. And that wall separating the church from the state, protecting the church from the state, not the state from the church, that wall has a door in it, and it's locked from the inside, where the church can open the door at will, go out into culture, do its good work, be salt and light as it's charged to be by Jesus himself, and when you're done engaging culture, doing this, engaging in the market square of ideas, asking good questions like Jesus did. To paraphrase, this is the Piper paraphrase, are women real or are they fake? Can you tolerate my intolerance? Do you hate hateful people? Are you sure that nothing is sure? Do you know that nothing can be known? Is it absolutely true that there are no absolutes? And when you're done asking those questions, those rhetorical questions like Jesus did when he said, do you wanna cast the first stone? Shut your mouth like Jesus did and let the worldview of your opponents um, implode. They will drop their stones and walk away. And then guess what? Go back through the door and lock it. That's what it's there for. I'm off script. I've got 10 minutes. <clears throat> Welcome to the Church of Holy Wokeness. A Black Lives Matter protest in Cary, North Carolina. A white woman takes her megaphone and says this to the crowd. We repent on behalf of uh, Caucasian people, she says. And then she calls on the crowd to kneel before two black pastors seated before them on park benches. And she audibly weeps and bows before them. At a church in Atlanta, Dan Cathy, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, genuflects before a black colleague while shining his shoes in a ritual atoning for, this is his language, collective shame for being white. Collective shame for the way God created him, the color of his skin. Not the content of his character, but the color of his skin. In Washington, D.C., thousands of people kneel at the foot of a monument to Martin Luther King Jr. in penance for the sins presumed to be endemic in their race. On the streets of New York City, a black man approaches numerous women, white women, and demands that they bow and apologize for who they are. He videotapes it while dozens upon dozens and dozens of white women comply and confess, bowing before him, almost in worship and penance. Democrat leaders wearing the priestly garb of Kente Stoles kneel in religious surrender at our nation's capital. This is all a fact. You've seen screenshots of all of it. You've seen it on YouTube and Rumble. You've seen the videos. Evangelical churches, too numerous to count, post laments. This comes directly from a church that I was a member of. A lament on their website, mourning the unjust fabric of society, and then calling on those who have light skin to confess their sin of willful obliviousness. Close quote. Theological seminary presidents at presumably conservative seminaries and denominations issue decrees that talk of confessing systemic racism and the presumption of evil that is resident in various shades of melanin. Welcome to the church of holy wokeness. 
Welcome to a church that preaches collective blame rather than individual repentance. A church of enablement rather than evangelism. A church that riots rather than has revival. Welcome to a church of collective guilt rather than one that preaches personal sin. Welcome to a neo-Marxist church that talks more about class conflict than the good news of salvation. A church of division rather than unity. One of us versus them. Of the 99 versus the one. A church of the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. Of balkanization rather than the Beatitudes. Welcome to a church that has more in common with the cultural revolution than it does with the cross of Christ. Welcome to a church of racists pretending to stand against racism. A church that marches for love while fomenting hate. Welcome to a church that is shamelessly intolerant while it pretends to be tolerant. It's a non-judgmental church that rushes to judgment. Welcome to a church that categorizes people by the color of their skin rather than the content of their character. Welcome to an affirming church, a church that tells you you're born that way rather than you must be born again. Welcome to a church that bows before men rather than standing for God. Welcome to a church that worships what it sees in the mirror while denying what it reads in the Bible. Welcome to a church that has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. A church that worships the created rather than the creator. A church that has been given over to a reprobate and debased mind. This is a church of intersectionality over inerrancy. Pay attention to its high priests. Listen to their words, hear their liturgy. Their virtuous virtue signaling, the dog whistles, the shouts to redistribute power and property. Learn their doctrine, the elevation of the group over the individual, the belief in government more than God, the parroting of Marx and Lenin and Mao, the ignorance of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Jesus. This is America's church. It's the church of group guilt. It's the cult of holy wokeness. It's nothing short of a new religion, folks. It's one that demeans men, degrades women, sacrifices children, elevates revenge, and encourages blame. Is that the gospel? This is a church whose leaders' minds are dark with confusion. Their theology is an inch deep with compassion and a mile wide with compromise. Welcome to the great awakening. Bow in submission. Pay homage to your gods with a lowercase g. In the last days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. Brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke. By paraphrase, use your elbow. <laughs> and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths." Close quote. St. Paul, the Bible, the truth of God. God's an errant word. I've got more here I could share, but what I'm trying to describe to you right now 
is the challenge that we face, and I think we all know we face it. The challenge, you know, I've had people ask me while I write and while I speak, and um, in social media, somebody will send me a question, how do we get in this mess? How in the world did this happen? It's a very simple answer. I think there are three entities that are responsible for passing on the ideas that are important to a culture, to a community. And I think those three entities are parents, preachers, and pedagogues, teachers. There are three entities that control the ideas of culture, that inculcate, cultivate, plow the rows of consistency, that bear fruit from that cultivation. It's what the word cult means. It's not necessarily a fake religion. Culture, cultivate, inculcate. There are three entities responsible for that. Parents, teachers, and preachers. The reason we're in this mess right now is we've all messed it up big time. Parents are more interested in being liked than being right. They coddle rather than confront. They enable rather than discipline. They want to be the friend of their child rather than the parent, the dad, the mom of their child. You know, guess what? There are times where my sons don't like me. And that's okay. Amen. If they like me all the time, I would suggest I'm not doing my job. And preachers, what in the world is wrong with the evangelical church? We have come to expect this from the mainline churches over the decades, but the evangelical church right now is stumbling over itself to compromise the evangel. The good news, the gospel of Christ has now become part and parcel, almost synonymous with a neo-Marxist rag like Black Lives Matter. And every one of us in here should say, all lives matter, black and white lives matter. We will not judge anyone by the color of their skin. We refuse. We are all part of the body of Christ. There is one race in the Bible. It's the human race, as Vody Bauckham says. Dare none of us ever venture into racist territory. But when you have an organization that specifically and proudly boasts of encouraging people to judge others by the color of their skin and ignore the content of their character, folks, that's the definition. That's Martin Luther King Jr.'s definition of racism. How dare the church forget that? The evangelical church. And how did we get in this mess? Our schools are a joke. I'm an educator. I believe in the ivory tower. I believe in the academy. I believe in the power of ideas. It changed my life. I believe in learning. I believe in a liberal arts education because it's an education in liberty and freedom. Because it's grounded in the words of Christ. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's where we get a free republic, a free people, a free country, and a free church. That's how we are set free from the consequences of our sins, as well as the consequences of someone else's. I believe in education, but our schools are a joke. Our schools are terrible right now. They've become re-education camps, and you shouldn't be surprised when your kids return to you re-educated. There are three entities that have dropped the ball, parents and pastors, and teachers. But the encouraging word, and I close with this, is you win. Jesus promised us that you win. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. We win. Oh, there may be a bump between here and that victory. It may not be pretty, but we win. I once worked for a boss. He was the uh, president of Spring Arbor College, my alma mater. 
And uh, every winter he would fly to Florida. Excuse me, let me back up. Every winter he would go to Florida. He would go to Florida, raise money, because Naples, Florida has the highest percentage of millionaires in, in December as any place in the, in the nation. So that's where presidents of colleges go to raise money. And my boss would go down there to raise money, but he would drive from Michigan to Florida, come back, and then he'd drive again from Michigan to Florida a couple times, three times throughout the course of the winter. And one day I asked him, Dr. Chapman, why do you drive? Why don't you fly? And he looked at me, serious as a heart attack, and he said, because I'm afraid of flying. I said, why? You're born again. Why are you afraid of flying? You're an old goat. You're going to die pretty soon anyway. Why are you afraid of flying? <laughs> he said, oh, I, I'm not afraid of death, Everett. I'm not afraid of eternity. I agree with you. It's not eternity that I'm afraid of. It's that two-minute drop from here to here. The moral of the story is, he knew he wins, but he's not too sure about the two minute drop in between the battle and the ultimate victory. I know that we're anxious, folks. I know that you're nervous about the two minute drop, but don't be. Jesus promised you the gates of hell will not prevail. It is time to get a spine, get some courage, get some clarity, because you're the ones that believe in liberty. You're the ones that believe in freedom. You're the ones that believe in women and that they're real. You're the ones who believe that they're your kids, not the government's. You're the ones who have the power of good ideas, right ideas, and the consequences of those ideas will be ultimate victory. Not woke ideas, not joke ideas, but right ideas. So grow a spine. I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Piper. Well, we've got about 10 minutes to take a few questions. And what was the key word there? Questions. Uh, not commentaries, not opinions, but questions, short questions. And I have a question way back here. Hang on one second. And I will always hold on to the microphone. Absolutely. My, my question is, is wokeness for, for the leaders of um, the opposition, is it the end game or the means to the end? And the reason I ask that question is when I look at societies that are socialist around the world, whether they be the former Nazi regime, the Z stood for the German word for Nazi, or the USSR, the second S was for socialist, etc., or even modern day Russia or China, I don't see their leaders pushing wokeness into their societies. So I'm wondering if it's a means to an end or the end itself, and if not, what are the ends, et cetera, if you have any ideas. Uh, it's a great question. Um, my answer isn't necessarily the right answer here, but I would suggest that wokeness is the religion of useful idiots. <laughs> and, and, and you know why I say that. Where did the term useful idiots come from? It came from the Soviet Union, right? Because, was it Khrushchev? His, I think he's the one that, Lenin? Is it, okay, so Lenin, maybe Khrushchev repeated it. But Lenin called those that could be easily used for his nefarious purposes useful idiots. And I think that's what Putin is doing right now. I think that's what China is doing. I think our enemies are watching us right now and laughing. I mean, Biden is puttering around the White House in his rainbow colored jammies. More, more interested in appointing, more interested in diversity. You've seen the pictures of his new appointment to the Nuclear Waste Division. It's a man that is dressed in a yellow chiffon gown with red pumps and red lipstick. I, he just appointed this man to the Nuclear Waste Division of something something. And then we've got Rachel Levin, Levine, who's our, the, the guy that pretends to be a woman who is the highest ranking military officer in our health and human services. I mean, Biden and the Democrats are more interested in diversity than they are defense. And Putin laughs, China laughs. They're building up strong armies while we're tearing down strong men. Good men. Masculinity is bad here. It's not bad over there. They laugh. So I do think it's a tool 
that they use to control useful idiots. All right. Another question? Uh, thanks for a presentation. And just trying to put a, put a little bit of line in today's access to YouTube's. A lot of it's on the one side, you see a lot of uh, openness to the uh, criticizing the ones who are seeker sensitive churches, and that's how wokeism slipped in. Could you comment a little bit on a more subtle thing? Uh, recently, a YouTube I've seen from a Miss Bashan on Daily Wire uh, with Francis Collins, NIH, and then tie that in with the Gospel Coalition. Uh, next question. <laughs> Remember, you have about five minutes. So. I, uh, I'm a fan of the Daily Wire, and I think that critique is fair. Um, I'm a fan of Kelly Monroe Kohlberg, who wrote the book Finding God at Harvard, and she's the one behind the scenes that has written and researched a lot on the funding of wokeism, the funding, the George Soros money that's flowing into the movement that has been dubbed rent and evangelical. So Soros and his acolytes are throwing a lot of money at you. I know for a fact that when a Christian college president is inaugurated today, he gets a letter from George Soros, or one of the foundations, not directly from George Soros, whatever it is. He gets a letter from that society offering a $100,000 grant as congratulations for his new presidency. No strings attached, right? Wrong. And George Soros knows it. So is the money influencing the Gospel Coalition? There's evidence that it is. Not all. There's still some good writers and good people therein. But there's evidence that some have been imbibing the Kool-Aid. And they're, they're drinking from the well. They're, they're eating from the trough. I think there's evidence that uh, Francis Collins um, was co-opted by that. Uh, is it power? Is it politics? Is it the price? Is it the money? I don't know. But I think all of us need to be careful. We need to be very careful to not be influenced by organizations and not align with organizations, not take a dime from organizations that do not share your rock-solid commitment to the inerrancy of Scripture, because otherwise the tail will start wagging the dog. And I do think that Daily Wire piece is fair. I, I'm a huge fan of, was a huge fan of David French. I used to quote him. I've got his book all underlined uh, in his defense of religious freedom, but uh, what David French is doing right now bewilders me when he criticizes conservatives and calls us white Christian nationalists just because we're patriotic and want to defend our borders. I, what are you talking about? I think his TDS has got the best of him. Ma'am? Oh, I just wondered what keeps you strong and focused in the storm? Well, somebody else is going to say, would you please go take your Ritalin because you've been ADHD all over the place here. So I'm not focused. Sure, I have been focused. Um, um, Sir, I think the best answer to that question is be true to your gifting. I really believe that God has given all of us a passion, a hunger, a drive. Uh, call it a spiritual gift. Call it a motivational thrust. Call it whatever you will. But each of us have been gifted to do things and to enjoy things. Some of us enjoy cooking and serving. Some of us enjoy fighting. Some of us enjoy the public limelight. Some of us shun it and just want to serve those that have that light shining on them. My point in answering your question, ma'am, is do what you know God has gifted you to do. Because that's your role in the army. That's your role on the team. Do what you're gifted to do. What keeps me focused is I hate to, maybe I shouldn't, I love the fight. I do, I've always loved the fight. When I was an athlete, I loved the fight. When I was a sibling to three brothers, I loved the fight. As a college president, I loved the fight. I loved the intellectual fight, I loved the fight, and there was one to be had. In the church, I love the fight. The fight is for the truth, the fight is for the word, the fight is for the gospel. So, this gets me jacked up. This is adrenaline for me. It may not be for some of you, and don't be discouraged if it's not. 
You may be gifted to guard my back. You may give, be gifted to organize somebody that's in desperate need of organization. You will be riding high. You will be walking with a spring in your step if you honor the gifting that God has given you, and that'll keep you encouraged. All right. Now, before we get to our last question here, how do we follow you, uh, your writings and other media? You're very gracious. Thank you for throwing that one out there. Um, seriously, I do have a daily radio show that uh, airs in Mulgee, Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma, by the way. Uh, on a daily basis, but it's uploaded as a podcast also. It's called The Rebellion. It's a one half hour talk radio show. It's basically monologue. Every once in a while I do interview somebody, but it's essentially daily commentary on the daily news, worldview engagement. It's called The Rebellion. So if you wanna find my stuff, go to DrEverettPiper.com. That's D-R-E-V-E-R-E-T-T-P-I-P-E-R.com. DR, as in doctor, everettpiper.com. That's my website. On my website, you will see uh, the, uh, the bar across the top that gives you access to all the various different tabs. You've got my columns, so you can access my columns from the Washington Times from that website. You'll see podcasts. You can access The Rebellion on that podcast. You can listen to it on SoundCloud or Apple or Spotify. Uh, you can, if you're interested in me speaking at your church or your organization, you can schedule that there. So that's the way you get the books, listen to the radio show, the podcast, and access my columns. So just go to my website. All right. Ma'am? Yes, I just wanted to ask you, how do we research and find the truth behind some of the people who have beliefs um, about the New World Order and about how they want to bring this world to what they believe, um, how do we research and make sure that these people, um, we know the truth about them, to uncover it so that we keep what God has put in our hearts pure so that we can forge forward and we're not bringing in the enemy into our own camp? Go to DrEverPiper.com. <laughs> 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 Go to the menu tab, bar at the top. No, um, uh, here's some organizations I would highly recommend that you follow on a daily basis. The Colson Center, they've got good stuff. They're, they're here and they should be here. The Colson Center, I'm a graduate of the Colson Center and they have excellent material on worldview engagement. Um, follow American Association of Evangelicals, not the National Association of Evangelicals, the American Association of Evangelicals, AAE. That is actually organized by Kelly Monroe Kulberg, the woman I just referred you to that's doing all the research and exposing the Renta Evangelical Movement that is funded by George Soros and the like. AAE, great material. I would recommend um, that you pay attention to um, the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics, the Colson Center for Worldview Stuff and biblical, Biblically Grounded Engagement. Um, and there are others, others out there. The Daily Wire, I mean, Ben Shapiro is an Orthodox Jew, but he has a lot of Christians that are writing for him that are very solid, speaking for him that are very solid. And Ben Shapiro is right on a lot of stuff. He's wrong about one big one, and that's Jesus, but he's right about a lot. Likewise, Dennis Prager, he's right a lot of, about a lot of stuff. So pay attention to the co-belligerence. Co-belligerence, remember what Francis Schaeffer taught us. You can lock arms with somebody who disagrees with you for a common cause. And I don't apologize for that. I've been on Glenn Beck's show repeatedly. I'm not Mormon. I disagree with Glenn on some very important things, but I will fight to the death with him for human freedom, religious freedom, and the dignity of a woman and the dignity of an unborn child. He's right on those things. You probably knew all of that, but those are some good organizations that'll keep you online. The AAE is probably a new one that you hadn't heard of. They specifically are trying to address your question by featuring uh, problems, telling you what they are, as well as pointing you toward the right uh, sources and resources. All right. Thank you. Am Thank you, Dr. Piper.